Welcome everyone, I'm Adbeshewa Josh and this is Africa Matters. The continent's most industrialized nation, South Africa, is a major magnet for many Africans who are looking for a better life or seeking refuge from conflict and climate-related challenges. But it's also one of the most unequal countries in the world. So immigration has become a major political issue ahead of next year's elections. We'll look at what the South African government's plan to overhaul its immigration system mean for the country and the rest of the continent. Statistics show South Africa had more than 2.4 million migrants last year, with nearly half of them coming from neighboring countries like Zimbabwe, followed by Mozambique and Lesotho. That's about 4% of the country's 62 million people. The country has also experienced bouts of violence and xenophobia in its history, largely driven by the perception that African migrants were taking jobs from unemployed locals. So the government is planning a major overhaul of its immigration policies, which it says are from the colonial era. Let's take a look at some of the major proposals. The South African government wants to review and or withdraw from the 1951 UN Convention on Refugees. It says they forbid them from refusing entry, expelling or extraditing asylum seekers and refugees. Pretoria also wants to repeal the Citizenship, Immigration and Refugee Act and replace them with a single law. And it also wants to set up an advisory board on immigration with representatives from the government departments, such as trade, labor, unemployment, police service, revenue services, among others. Let's hear more from Tembisa Fakude, Senior Research Fellow, Africa Asia Dialogues. He joins me from Bangkok, Thailand. Tembisa, first of all, you look very, very amazing in your South African attire. Thank you so much for joining Africa Matters. Thanks for having me. Let's start with, is South Africa facing a migration crisis, as the government describes it? Well, um, I think so, but you also must remember that this is the elections time. So there are a lot of things that the government will try and solve. And as, as is always the case with other countries around the world, the first victims of election, the election period is often the immigrants. And I think that's what's happening at the moment in South Africa. Yes, there is a problem of uh, illegal immigrants and the illegal immigration. But uh, many of us are questioning the timing uh, particular of this proposed legislation. So do you not think that solving it with overhauling the immigration laws is, is the way to go, or are there other ways to do it? Well, the government has been uh, failing in its attempt in trying to, number one, um, deport the Zimbabweans that are in South Africa illegally and those that came to South Africa post the violence of 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've been hitting a brick wall in that regard with many civil society organization uh, siding with the Zimbabweans in terms of funding their legal challenges and battle. So I think the best the government thought um, to do is to overhaul the entire legislation because that's the basis of our, constitu our, our constitutional democracy. So that's why you see now this talk of overhauling the entire immigration system. And, you know, they give you reasons why they're doing so, right. that the South African legal system is quite lenient to criminals, for example, who come from various parts of the world, not necessarily Africans, mm. and find refuge in South Africa because of our lenient uh, immigration laws. You know, politicians will always be politicians, right? But one thing you have to give to them is they respond to the people. They respond to the majority of the people's concern. And that's why we keep seeing them flip-flopping everywhere in the world. So would you say that the, what's behind the volatile public opinion when it comes to foreigners and um, the old xenophobic attacks is what the government is trying to address with this overhaul yeah, but, of the immigration system? Yeah, but the, the people who are anti-immigration, there's one organization called Tudula Movement, they never garner more than 200 people in their matches, which mm. therefore tells you that South Africans are not really in favor of these kind of sentiments. Mm. Yeah, they're allowed and they get airtime, but if you really go to their matches wherever they protest, it's never more than 200 to 300 people. In fact, the matches that are meant to support uh, immigrants in South Africa and protect immigrants in South Africa are much, much more larger than what you normally see from the so-called 
anti-migration uh, organization and movement. So it's not a very large, overwhelming majority that will, one will argue necessitate a government no political reaction in terms of trying to solve this problem, which is, yeah, of course, there is a challenge because of limited uh, government resources and infrastructure, which is not really meant to cater for others, but only for those that are counted by the census in South Africa. Um, so you have a lot of people that are, are illegal because of mainly from Zimbabwe that has always been facing economic and political challenges. But how you deal with that, of course, requires us to adhere to various humanitarian uh, international law. So, Fakude, if I'm getting you correctly, there isn't a lot of support among the population for this. And if that's the case, how, does it, how is this supposed to work? Because I understand as, for, as of now, it's a proposal. It's not yet an act. What are the processes that are supposed to come after this? I did see somewhere, though, that uh, the government is calling uh, on public opinion, you know, to weigh in and say, are you for or against it? What's supposed to happen next? Well, the ANC's majority in the governing party, which is right. the ANC, African National Congress, is the majority within the South African um, parliament. So chances are, after all of this consultation, this law is going to pass because they mm -hmm. are in majority. And I think they'll try and push it before election. So once it's law, then it becomes easy for government to implement that law. At the moment, we've got these ad hoc actions by government in terms of trying to deport certain people, and they can't. Because, again, as I've said, there is uh, always a pushback from civil society mm. in terms of protecting the illegal immigrants in this country. But um, I think once it becomes enacted into law, it's going to become very, very difficult for any of the immigrants coming to South Africa illegally or seeking asylum, as but it's always been the case. The Home Affairs Minister, I believe, did say something about withdrawing from the uh, international refugee conventions, uh, including the 1951 UN Convention on Refugees, to be able to implement if the law is passed, what are the implications of that? And if they do not withdraw, or if they're not able to withdraw for whatever reason, is it possible to still implement this law? Well, South Africa, unfortunately, is embracing a very populist uh, approach when it comes to its politics, particularly the African National Congress. It's not the first time that we've had governments threatening to pull, from, pull out from the international body. Mm. They've said so um, after the failure for them to uh, apprehend President uh, Bashir of Sudan when he visited South Africa, because South Africa was one of those that has endorsed and certified the Roman statute. So he was supposed to be arrested in 2016 when he came to South Africa, and they failed to do so. Mm. Then they threatened that they were going to pull out of the ICC. Now we're seeing them doing exactly the same thing. Notwithstanding, of course, that they continue saying that they are for multilateralism, they support international uh, conventions, etc. But what we see at the moment is we're seeing a a, a, a sulking child because he can't get his way through. Mm. So, um, well, we'll see how that goes then. Tembisa Fakude, Senior Research Fellow, Africa Asia Dialogues. Thank you so much for joining us in your beautiful South African attire. Thank you for having me. I still to come here on the program. Klein Vintuk, Wellness Homestead, a day spa with an African touch hires and trains visually impaired therapists to provide holistic health care to walk-in clients and tourists from all over the world. And I am Palum David in Abuja with the story of the initiative set up by filmmaker Donald Unanka to amplify the voices of people with disabilities in their fight for inclusion. In Nigeria, many aspiring actors find it difficult to get jobs. It's even worse for those with a disability, as many filmmakers consider working with a disabled actor as a burden to production. Though 15% of the world's population experience some form of disability, the World Bank says it's worse in developing countries. Balom David brings us the story of a disabled actor rewriting her own story. Having disabilities and working in Nigeria's film industry in Hollywood is rare. But Ave Aki is trying to break barriers. 20 years ago, she was in an accident and had to have an amputation, which left her with disabilities. A lot of um, producers out there don't really want to work with persons with disabilities. A good couple of them are approached about why are we not involved in the movie industry? Why do you have to like 
make someone without a disability act a disability scene and they get to tell me that okay getting a person with disability on the set will slow down their production and also not all producers are willing to invest money in the pity kind of stories after being repeatedly turned down by movie producers aki got herself some equipment and became the star of a self-produced web series to fight the sort of discrimination she found herself facing. We be women with disability and you understand how relationship happens to us. Early this year, that was February, I started producing the series and um, to the glory of God, I've produced a couple of it out there right now. We have um, we have about 16 episodes already on ground and we're working on another 16, 20 episodes right now. Aki also got support from Donald Unanka, a creative director who started an initiative in 2012 to support actors, producers and directors with disabilities. When any of the uh, producers want to tell a story that has to do with a person with disability, they, they portray us to be very uh, kind of poor people, people that are you know, heavily stigmatized. So now, right now, we're engaging them, saying, how, why not, uh, instead of portraying us in that light, why not, for example, let us have a person with disability, for example, to be father of a very rich man, you know, that is very influential in the community, you understand? So that way, we begin to change perceptions gradually. Nigeria's film industry, known as Nollywood, is the second largest in the world with over 2,000 movies produced annually and an audience in the region of 200 million people across Africa. But very few people with disabilities have the chance to actively participate in this massive sector due to negative stereotypes about what they can and can't do. People don't really believe in us, but Okay, let me put it personally. People don't believe that I can do this, but I believe in myself. And if I'm given the opportunity to, to go into Nollywood, I will do that gladly. The film industry is one of Nigeria's biggest employment sectors, and disability rights and inclusion advocates are now determined to open the doors to this industry for members of their communities. Palum David. Africa Matters, Abuja. In a world where people living with disabilities are often overlooked, marginalized, and denied access to opportunities, their chances of achieving upward mobility are small. In Namibia, a team at a unique wellness center is working to rewrite the narrative and equip visually impaired young women with skills in holistic health care. Vitalio Angula reports from the capital, Windhoek. Martha Abed has had problems with her eyesight since she was a child. Things took a turn for the worse in her teenage years when she lost it completely. She was forced to drop out of school in grade 10 with poor grades. But her fortunes turned around after a visit to one of Namibia's eye specialists landed her a job at the Nomad Wellness Day Spa. Disability, not inability. When, if you are disabled, doesn't mean that that is the end of your life. The day spa started operations 15 years ago and gradually transitioned into a fully integrated wellness homestead. It's run by Marianne Akwenye, who says proving disability is not inability is the inspiration behind her work. I walked into a lecture room as the group of, of trainees were being trained at the time and the lecturer simply said, close your eyes and be in tune with the body. And that sparked something in my mind to think, oh, hang on. If we have to instruct sighted women how, you know, to actually focus and be, for them to be able to focus, to close their eyes and so on, what about women with visual impairment or blind women? Where are they, you know? Um, so that's, it literally started like that. When it first opened, the day spa had an intake of 20 visually impaired trainees and only six of them graduated. But it hasn't deterred Akwenye, who continues to provide opportunities to train more and more visually impaired young women. Yolandi Enkard works as a trainer at the center, equipping students with vocational skills to allow them independence. A beautician by training, Enkard has been with the institution since its inception. 
we teach them everything about the human body. We teach them anatomy, physiology, basic business skills. And then with a the practical, yeah, you have to physically take their hands and show them how to do the massage. You can't just, for a sighted person, for example, you will just tell them this is how you do it. But for visually impaired, because they can't see you, you have to physically show them how they must do each movement on the body. Nevelina Mwenye is a regular at the establishment. She said her sister-in-law, who works in the field of women empowerment, brought her along for a girls' day out, and since then she has fallen in love with the experience. I do believe that when you look at therapy, specifically with reflexology, you're able to focus on certain um, pressure points within the body, as Sarah is doing right now with my foot, where you know that certain ailments that you might actually be experiencing can somehow be not necessarily cured, but they can be, the impact in terms of pain can actually be lessened. The day spa, which is set up with a contemporary African feel, deviates from the standard that clients, especially tourists, are used to. The Nomad Wellness Homestead redefines holistic well-being and caters to the spiritual, physical, psychological, and emotional needs of its clients. And this is felt in the ambience and traditional African decor. Vitalio Angula, Africa Matters, Wintuk, Namibia. Militants affiliated with Al-Qaeda and Daesh have been expanding their presence from the southern Sahara Desert into the coastal states of West Africa. Ilias Avji looks at one country which has been particularly affected by the spread of terrorism. People in the northern part of Benin live in a constant state of fear. Every day, day and night, security forces work and the population is ready to cooperate. So when people talk about terrorism, people think we must be exposed because of our close proximity to Burkina Faso. Religious extremist attacks against civilians in Benin have almost tripled from the previous year, with the epicenter of their activities in the northern regions, according to the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. Experts say collaboration between the Beninese government and local communities could help keep people safe. There is a the important need to um, build trust and work closely with the communities to ensure that uh, they don't um, progress in terms of um, penetrating the country. But militants have many strategies, like recruiting individuals, or worse, coercing them into becoming informants. Something many locals are trying to escape. And the displacement of people creates additional challenges. The big concern today is how to feed people. We will move with people from their communities because of terrorism. They join other communities. They, during this year, most of them didn't fall. And it is very difficult for them how to feed them, how to take care of them, their health, and so on and so forth. It's also a growing concern for the government. Officials have also been trying to control the flow of information and fake news, as some locals don't believe the reports of extremist problems. But it's a complicated issue. Rights groups say the government's efforts to control information and arbitrary arrests of individuals suspected of collaborating with religious extremists is only making things worse. Ilya Savju, Africa Matters. We head back to South Africa, which is the world's most unequal country, with 10% of the population owning more than 80% of the country's wealth. That's according to a 2022 World Bank report. Experts say the country's education system reflects this inequality and ultimately perpetuates it. Bushra Gokdash explains. 4.30 a.m. and a long day is just starting for students in South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province. With no school bus service, getting to class means a long, dusty trek. Luyunda Hilali and her friend are on their daily two-hour walk from their village to the nearest public school. They are part of the more than 200,000 school children in South Africa for whom access to education is difficult. 
I usually get to school at around 7 a.m. and arrive tired. I often struggle to concentrate on what the teacher is saying and I sometimes fall asleep. When the teachers reprimand me, all I can tell them is that I'm tired. Amnesty International says a child's schooling experience in South Africa depends very much on where in the country they were born. In KwaZulu-Natal province, more than 30% of 12.4 million people are unemployed and they depend on state welfare to survive. That means they can hardly afford school transport, which is in short supply. Recent government figures show that more than 1,100 schools in the province are on waiting list for school bus services. For these kids, they already start very early, so they haven't had their sleep up till there. So what happens in the brain is when you are tired, the uh, neurotransmitters, those um, things that must carry the messages to your prefrontal cortex, they do not work. They, they really do not work. And it doesn't matter how smart you are, how intelligent you are, the brain is like a computer and it works in a specific way. Non-profit campaign group Equal Education was founded in 2014 to address the problem of school access in the region. It says the lack of government-funded school transportation is a profound problem. When parenting in KZN in particular, it means that you need to be worried on an hourly or minute rate when you know that my, my child is traveling to school because of also the conditions in the province. So uh, it's, it's a call, this thing, uh, for parents, SGP members to start bringing such conversations to parents meeting, SGP meetings, for them to keep talking about their conditions of learners, because we can't be normalizing such situations. Despite ranking among the top 10 richest African countries, South Africa faces an inequality crisis that could affect many of today's students for decades to come. Bushra Guktash, Africa Matters. And staying in the country this week, we head north to explore the city of Polokwane, which is halfway between Pretoria and Zimbabwe. The city of around 630,000 residents is the largest urban center north of the capital and is an important economic hub. Let's take a look. That's our show this week. Kindly share your thoughts and suggestions about the stories you've seen in this episode or ideas on what you would like us to cover on X using the hashtag Africa Matters. Feel free to reach out to me and my personal handle at Adeshewa Josh. You can watch this episode and more on YouTube. Just search Africa Matters TRT World. Like, comment, and please continue to share. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you next week.